One of my favorite all-time family movies has to be uh, Princess Bride. How many of you like that movie? Love that movie. Uh, you know, you can learn a lot about life and love, true love, uh, from, from that movie. Uh, so many famous lines, uh, you know, come from that movie. Uh, maybe you can help me fill in those blanks. How about this one? When I was your age, television was called books. That's right. Very good. As you wish. There you go. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. There you go. Prepare to die. Death cannot stop true love. All it can do is delay it for a while. Yeah. Remember they, that you learned about in that movie what mostly dead and all dead, what the difference is, right? <laughs> in that movie. Uh, in, there you go, inconceivable. Uh, here's another one. This was from Buttercup. She said, you mock my pain. And then the man in black goes on to say, life is pain. Highness, anyone who says differently is trying to sell you something. Well, before the movie Princess Bride, there was uh, kind of a, a TV show that uh, reminds me of that classic line, life is pain. Before Princess Bride, there was my parents' favorite show, and that was Hee Haw. How many of you remember <laughs> Hee Haw, right? Who could forget, and I'm going to need some help on this one. Who, who, could, who can remember, I, I need some woes in here, all right? Let, let, me, let me give you the, the, the famous song, Gloom, Despair, and Agony on Me. Oh, come on. Gloom, Despair, and Agony on Me. Whoa. Oh, that wasn't really very good. Deep, Dark Depression, Excessive Misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. You guys are awful. Yeah, I just said you all were wonderful. Now I'm, I, I'm backtracking on that. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. That was my parents' favorite uh, show and maybe the favorite song. Unless we think that we've gotten past that whole life is pain motto, listen to this book title. It is Generation Me, Why Today's Young Americans Are More Confident assertive, entitled, and more miserable than ever before. That's by Dr. Jean M. Uh, Twingy. Uh, and that goes along with that, what we've seen in the news lately with that young man that's still, is he still in Mexico? The affluenza uh, teenager. It goes right along with uh, that book title. It's safe to say that every generation has its struggles and its troubles. The same was true in the life of a guy by the name of Jeremiah. Uh, we would know him as the weeping prophet. There were dark days in Israel too. In fact, a priest named Jeremiah was commissioned and ordained by God, set apart by God to be a prophet. And it was his mission from Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 10. The Lord said to him, See, today I appoint you over the nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down. Doesn't that sound pleasant? To destroy and overthrow. And then he says to build and plant. Jeremiah was the prophet who was the one who had the duty of predicting the fall of Judah. He had the responsibility of telling them that Babylon, uh, the Babylonians were coming and there was going to be a great deportation. In fact, there were three different deportations of, of Israelites as they were led off in chains to Babylon to become slaves of that Babylonian empire. In Jeremiah 29, he even writes to those who were exiled in Babylon. And you know what he says? This is, this is great cheer. Uh, he says to those in, in chapter 29 of Jeremiah, he says, get comfortable because you're going to be there for 70 years. In fact, he says, pray for the success of your captors. <laughs> Talk about 
gloom, despair, and agony on me. I imagine that all of those slaves, as they were being deported, just let out a collective, woe is me. Life is pain, gloom, despair, and agony. Every generation encounters it. Yet, in the midst of that pain and the gloom and despair of uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, we see one of the most beautiful verses in the entire Bible, one that has had a profound impact on my life, and one that we pray has a profound impact on the lives of the people that were just up here, those parents with their little babies. Uh, A verse that, well, it just gives us hope in a future. We saw it earlier, but it, it's found in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. Beautiful verse. Plans to give you hope. When your children leave home, what will they take with them? Have you ever, ever thought about that? When your children live, leave home, what will they take with them? As parents, what do we hope to give to our children as they leave the nest? And if our children are in here, they're, they're thinking already about the uh, seas of life. You know what those seas are? All right, let me, let me go down through them. And I think I'm putting them in the order of which they want them, all right? The first one is they all got to have a cell phone, all right? That's the first C. They got to have a car as they go off to college. They need cash. I think actually they would prefer a credit card before cash. That might go ahead of that. Uh, Maybe the computer actually needs to go right behind the uh, cell phone. Uh, cell phone, computer, then the car, and the cash, credit card, so forth. They want a college education. I'm not sure they really want to work for it, but they want a college education. Then they want a career, and then they want someone, oh, should we say cohabit, someone to cohabit with, because we're not talking about marriage these days, right? And then we hope that they want children of their own someday so we can get some sort of payback. Yeah, these are the seas of life. In short, we want them to have the American dream. But imagine having all of that and being miserable, being filled with hopelessness about life and the future, and being more miserable, says the book, than ever before. After all, can the stuff of life shield us from painful experiences? No. In fact, the stuff of life may actually hinder our kids from coping with their pain, the pain that we inevitably have. So if hope doesn't come from the American dream, then where does it come from? The real C is Christ in their hearts. Put your hope in me, Jesus says. Notice how many times we see the word plans in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. In the midst of the pain, God says, I have plans for you. You are not abandoned. You are loved. You see, difficult situations and wrong choices often conspire to trap us in hopelessness. Satan is on a mission and he wants to steal your hope. Often he does it by having you stay focused on your painful past, distracted and distraught about the present which leads to a hopelessness for your future. Brothers and sisters, it is not about where you've been or what you've done. God can take the most hopeless situation and turn it around, retool it, revive you, and renew you. When we realize that God loves us and when we understand that God has a plan for us that extends further than the pain, What wells up within us is a hope that no one can take away. So from where does this hope spring? From Powerball? (laughs) No, it doesn't come from Powerball. If not there, then where? 
hee-haw and the man in black both point us to the problem of pain, but neither provide for us a plan to overcome that pain. But listen to what Jesus says. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son that He loves. Many of us may discover very late in life that we've, we're lost. And we're in a hopeless situation. And we're in need of rescue. Many may just be realizing that, that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. You've been seeing random pictures, haven't you? <laughs> Up there, I hope, anyway. Maybe. Uh, pictures that really have no purpose being in a message about hope in a future. You see, there's no other explanation for the fact that I'm here this morning other than the amazing and saving hand of God. I'm blessed because I've always known I'm special to God. And that God has a plan for my life. I'm, but as I say that, I realize I'm no more special than you. Did you know that you are special to God? Thank you, Fred. You are. You, uh, you saw pictures of a beautiful mother in maybe a fur coat. Later, she would pay for my abortion for that little girl. You saw a ballerina. A few years later, she would walk down an alley and into an underground abortion clinic in Vancouver, British Columbia. You saw a baby and it was the same one that was being carried by that ballerina. And in another picture, you saw a happy young couple in San Diego, California, by way of Johnson Bible College. She'd been crying because they'd been told they could not have children. And as she cried and was listening to the radio, an ad came on the radio and said, you could adopt. It was about the same time that uh, that that baby came along. There's a picture of that same little guy at about two years old. I wonder what he might look like today. You see... You are not random to God. Not one of you. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope. And now Sherry's going to come up and talk about your future. Our future is housed in what we're created to be. And it's housed in what we're created to do. You see, God has a plan to give you a future. It's written upon our lives from before we were born. Our future is decided in the image we possess, in our giftedness, and what he has designed for us to do. You know, there's a, a, a statement that's been made and filtered through all different areas. We were born with a blank slate, but I'm here to say we were not born with a blank slate. It's a concept I've never liked and I've never believed in. I can't believe in it biblically. You see, when Jonathan and Carissa came into this world, they already had formulated into them the image of God. They already had formulated into their lives their giftedness and their personalities and the good works that God had prepared for them to do. You have to. I have to. 
See, first of all, we were made in the image of God. Genesis 1, 27 says this, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. He had a design for that image. You see, we were created to act like him, and that's how we look like him. No, we don't have the facial features and all those things that God has. We don't even know what God looks like, but we know what he acts like. And it's found in the fruits of the Spirit. That's how we look like God. We possess love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's our image, and that's what's implanted in us, and there houses our future. We were knit together in our mother's womb. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16 say, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well, and you are his work. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You are not a blank slate. It was all written in his book from the day, moments before you were even born. Secondly, we are made with giftedness. Our future and what we are has to do ha with our lives are housed in these gifts supplied to us by design. You know, some of you can probably look back over your life and know what you were bent to do, what your personalities were like. God designed you that way. Do you know what your spiritual gifts are? How well are you living out that purpose? I knew from a little girl that I was destined to teach someday, somehow, and in some way. And God has so blessed that design in multiple ways and in multiple times. Thirdly, we are made to serve him. It's designed for us to do that. It's where our future is housed. Our future is prepared beforehand by God to serve him. And it's in our service we find our greatest peace and contentedness. Are you enjoying that or are you in a state of restlessness? Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's our future. How well are you living out your future? Secondly, in regard to our future, there's a phrase that was um, made popular during the uh, Clinton era with Hillary Clinton. And I don't know if it's because of her. I don't like the phrase. I think it's more than that. It's the whole purpose behind that. It doesn't take a village, by the way. It takes a family. I didn't realize that Bob Dole had come alongside later until I was reading through some articles this week. And he said the same thing. So I think together we stand right. It doesn't take a village. It takes a family. In fact, it takes two families. It takes our earthly family, and it takes our church family. You know, it's very difficult to do life without either one of them. Number one under that, our God-given future is lived out in our family's commitment to raise our children. In Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, it says this, and I read it earlier. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. There's um, a magazine floating around our church this week. I'd encourage you to pick it up. It's our Christian standard. We get it here every week. And this particular one is dedicated toward life, children, and families. It's called Welcome the Children. In there is a great article by Teresa Welch. I know her. She followed me in teaching at Ozark Christian College. She does a rephrase of Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7. I really like it. Listen to this. She says, tell the stories of God around your dinner table and sing songs to God as you drive to school. Pray together each night and repeat the words of God as you get ready each morning. Wear bands on your wrists that remind you of God's truth. Post scripture throughout your bedrooms and your bathrooms and your kitchens and your living rooms so that your children are surrounded by the word of God. Our future is lived out and our family's commitment 
to raise our children. Secondly, our God-given future is lived out in our family's commitment to encourage our children. I was going through some slides and pictures this week, and I like this one that came up with uh, Mufasa and his little cub Simba. It said, Dad, what's giving up? It said, I don't know, son. We're Christians. I like that particular phrase because when Christians stick together, there is power in community. I like the passage out of Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. In fact, it's one of my favorite. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I couldn't do life without my church family. You're important to me. You're important to our future. You're important to our kids' future. And thirdly, our God-given future is lived out in our family's commitment to multiply the kingdom of God. This secures our children's future and our children's children's future for generations to come. God made that promise in First Chronicles. He said, whatever we do with our children will be lived out to the third and the fourth generation. How well are you building faith in your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren? It's done now in who you are and your faithfulness until the whole world comes. So let me ask you, in regard to hope and future, as we take this and make some applications for us personally, how will you fulfill the commitment in the family of God to secure a hope and a future for ourselves and for our children and our grandchildren that come after us?